So I know some of us, we talked about this uh, a little bit last time, but thinking about dynamic composition. So what is dynamic composition and what does it mean? So one of my new favorite websites is, uh, you got, I'm, I'm sure you all used Wikipedia before, right? Mm -hmm. So man, this, this new website I love is called wiktionary.org. It's my new favorite website. Every time I want to search anything, I just search, I just go to wiktionary.org. And I, this is probably, I probably use this website more than, than I use Google now. And so whenever I think about a certain concept, I just, I just Google, I just uh, wik wiktionary it. And essentially this is something that's very interesting. If you want to learn more about composition art, do the French have it down because like, you know, last time I was in France, you know, you're talking about art. So, oh, très dynamique and da, 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 right? So you just learn how to say the French words. But it, almost essentially everything comes back to the ancient Greek or Proto-Indo-European or Latin. So I kind of like that. The, the notion of um, dynamic essentially means powerful or power. And so even thinking about uh, composition, the, the new terms also I want to introduce with us is think to yourself, is this a powerful or a weak composition? As, and also as I'm lecturing, feel free to write down some notes on your, your laptop or write on a piece of paper or whatever. So this is why I think it's important because, you know, if I'm Christopher and I could bench press like 500 pounds, I'd say, wow, Christopher is very powerful. But if Christopher could only bench press 30 pounds, I was like, he is very weak. <laughs> so um, I think with composition, what we're trying to do is we want a powerful dynamic photograph, which is powerful. And even the word dynamic is interesting. Um, you know, you think about Wile E. Coyote and the dynamite, you know, TNT. And typically what is weak is things which do not have some sort of cohesion and so forth. So to talk about composition, this is quite interesting. So in terms of a theory about composition, like I mean, everyone feel free to just like speak out loud. Um, why do you think composition is important? Well, I think that like most people can take a picture of like the surroundings, even if you're in the same place, but like a good photographer can choose a certain frame in that surrounding and then, uh, you know, by using composi composition and then make a good photo out of it. Mm. Well, I mean, in some ways it means to select, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our, uh, as photographers, I mean, we have, you know, as I think you were saying in the last workshop, like an infinite variety of things to, you know, cut mm -hmm. out of with our, with the frame of our, 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 our camera. Mm -hmm. And the composition is basically selection. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not, if you're not selecting, Hmm. then you're not paying attention to sort of like the most important choice you have as a photographer. Hmm. Um, so, hmm. I, I don't hmm. know. Maybe that's like more like I'm overthinking what you're looking for, but no, no, no I love it. I think um, uh, all, all thinking is good. And I actually really like, I actually really like that one too. Is that like, I like the notion of selecting or uh, thinking about uh, scissors. Like, did you guys ever do this as a kid? Like when you, you had old newspapers or magazines and we would take out um, your scissors and you would cut out the, the funny comics that you liked or you would cut out like little things that you liked? Yeah. Yes. All right, Erin, what was your favorite thing to cut out? Mm. I liked like the far side, do you remember? Oh yeah, good old far side. Yeah. yeah. Yo, does anyone here grow up to Calvin Hobbes? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. All right, we're gonna have to talk about that uh, next workshop. Um, but yeah, so I could actually quite like Dylan and uh, Chris, your guys' notions on uh, composition because essentially composition, you're an image selector because mm -hmm. there's a quadrillion different things that you could photograph. And essentially it's your, you're kind of like a visual surgeon. You decide what to, what to, you know, what to show, what to select, or what not to select. So, to give you guys um, a fun little demo. All right, y'all can see my screen. Yes. All right. So, <laughs> it's my feet. These are you guys. Oh, do do you love this? Do you like my candle standing desk? 
<laughs> that is so I mean, if, if it works, awesome. you know. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, man, I, I, I'm having so much fun. Okay, so to give you a sense, right? So here's my feet. Here's my 300 square foot apartment. And here's the window that looks outside, right? So there's the, you all see the Superman building? Yes. So this is kind of interesting. So I could, I could photograph this like a quadrillion different ways. I could photograph it like this. I could photograph it like this. I could photograph it like, like, like that, you know, or, you know, you know, some people you could like zoom in all the way and photograph it like, like that too, right? Typically with it, when it comes to composition, I'm not a big fan of uh, zooming or, you know, cropping or telephoto, whatever, because to me, composition is far more interesting when it's a creative constraint where, you know, and also I try to think it's like, how can I photograph this a little bit more novelly than other people have? So, you know, this is the typical photograph everyone shoots, but I'm so much more interested in like doing techniques where I, I like do a composition, like kind of something like that. Like that, that's a far more interesting composition than that, right? And so typically the, the, the gist is composition to me, it's all about this notion of uh, creative constraints because when it comes to your compositions, there's like a quadrillion different ways that you could uh, photograph something. And so for example, you could, you know, decide to just photograph like that, right? And I, you know, I kind of mentioned this in the last workshop is uh, remembering that like, there's so much life outside of the frame. And this is actually what's, what's very interesting to me as a photographer. So kind of to Chris's point, right? Is that we could essentially block out. So essentially when you're photographing stuff, you're deciding what to keep in, you're deciding what to select, and you're deciding what to, to not show. And so when it comes to, I guess, uh, effective compositions, I think it's, um, it's really important and interesting to think about what to select or not. So yeah, and also ultimately with composition, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. Like even me, I like to study etymology to kind of get to the, the root of the words. And that, that doesn't mean that there's an ultimate truth. To me, I think good composition, it's kind of fun, interesting, dynamic, powerful, and kind of fun. So uh, I, I, I wiktionary this and then uh, like according to wiktionary, it means composition means composicio, which means with position. And so these are just some general definitions I found. Um, and it's kind of interesting because when we talk about composition, it's not just, you know, photography composition. It's like, you know, there's different, um, there's different fields in which we use the term composition, right? So even back in the day, like they would say a person's personality or the temperament or how they're feeling is like, oh, how is your composition? Or back in the day, composition was like a, a sum of money that you would give to reach a settlement or also like in, um, in music, right? There's musical compositions. And what is the, what is that class that everyone had to do in like elementary, middle school, high school that no one really liked? English composition? English composition, no one like that class, right? It's like, yo, I already, I already know how to speak English. Why am I taking a class on English? <laughs> so um, if you guys all take a look at the, the picture on the right side. So this photograph, actually I shot it. Um, so this is actually one of the benefits of having a full-time job and just going on and shooting photos. Like at the time I just graduated from college, I was like 22 and I was working for like a tech startup and I was in Santa Monica and like what I would actually do is like, I would just milk my employer for all they were worth and try to do the minimum amount of work necessary not to get fired. <laughs> and just after work or during my lunch break, I would just go out and shoot photos, which I actually find is a, a quite a good life strategy. But anyways, so this is a photograph I shot just around the block of my, uh, my workplace. I, I saw the, the background of the scene. I essentially just waited for somebody to enter the frame. And so this one technique, you know, Henri cartier Poisson and photographers often do this, this is called the fishing technique. You know, you just, you set up your composition and just wait for the fish to get in. So if you look at the photo on the right side, what are the compositional techniques you, uh, you find uh, interesting or the, the lines or the shapes or the forms? 
like the arrow. The arrow? <clears throat> I like there's like a play between symmetry and asymmetry so that you, mm. you've got you've got you know certain elements of the frame are symmetrical mm. or you know a sort of mirror images of each other but then um, but then it's not in other ways the lines like you know uh, are you know are not symmetrical mm. so even though know, maybe they're yeah or you know it's sort of just all like that that centered bauble thing is is not I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, I also like the arrow that is pointing towards the person that is in in the center. Mm. Okay, so this is this is kind of a, a fun thing I like to do too. So, um, so if you think about composition, okay. So to keep it super simple, right? I typically think that if you want to make a very strong, solid composition, you just you don't actually need more than one subject. You could just have one person. And what I typically like to do when I think about my compositions is. I just try to keep it as simple as possible. And the, the irony is actually, when people tend to overcomplicate compositions is actually not good, where people tend to overanalyze them and stuff like that. I think, I think a good composition, it could be good and simple. So this is one thing I like to think about when it comes to composition is like, essentially the question is, where do you put your subject? So for example, if we're looking at this picture, right? So that's my subject, right? Mm -hmm. So. I could either, I have options. I could either put him here. <laughs> so would that be as effective? No. Why not? I don't feel him as the center of it all. Mm. I think it, also because the arrows point, pointing to the bike. Yeah. And then he's also kind of framed mm. um, between the, the lights. Yeah. So he kind of fits fits better there, but not, even though you were fishing, it doesn't seem so on purpose. Okay, I have a question, Aaron. What if, <laughs> what if uh, was there? <laughs> no. Why not? I don't know, just aesthetically, it doesn't work for my brain. I can't put it into words. Mm. I, 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 I mean, I like that. That, that might be because of the, the top part of it, right? There, there's symmetry there. Yeah. I would sort of expect something to be in the middle of mm. the line. Because maybe oh, the... So now, it's, now it's all shifted. It just feels like a... doesn't feel like a keeper anymore. Mm. Well, I also feel like he, I, I don't know the story anymore. I see him going off somewhere where before he was part of a journey and I was part of it with him. So, Patrick, what if, what if, he, was, what if he was here? If he was there and the arrow was closer to him... I would still feel like he's part of this, right. like he matters. How about, how about like, how about that? But not as much as the center. Mm. How, about, how about this? I, I think it's just that there's like too much weight in the center of the photograph. Mm. That if you have like another subject competing with the, the ornament in the middle, like mm. it just kind of, it's like a little bit, like this year, you know, like it can't really tell what is trying to grab at my attention. Mm. Maybe mm -hmm. I read read some of your emails, Eric. Maybe it's mm -hmm. the triangles. Ooh, Aaron, good A plus plus. Where do you see oh, the triangles? Oh wow. A um, plus plus. Where do you see the triangles? Like you can almost draw a, a triangle from the bike mm -hmm. like up to the left. To here? Yep, exactly. And then back down. And then back down here? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then the same on the other side. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right. What else, what else do y'all see? I think the person the bike itself is a small triangle. In its, Ooh. In its own. So the, the, the bike itself could be a small triangle. Astute, astute observation, senor. So we could turn this into a small little triangle. Uh -huh. What else? Well, I'll see. I'll see. At the top of the the picture are the metal balls that you can see a triangle there. Mm. Well, where do you see it? Yeah. The shadow. Yeah, yeah, the shadow up mm. and down. Mm. So, 
you essentially see what we're doing here together. Um, this is kind of a, something that I like to do for fun because essentially like it's, it's kind of a fun way for us to just kind of like analyze our images in much more interesting ways. And actually um, this is something that I find very, very interesting for myself too, is that when it comes to looking at my pictures, I mean, before I did photography, I liked, I liked as a kid, I liked to draw and paint. And, you know, I just like to use crayons or whatever. And the funny thing is as, actually as a kid, before you learn all these rules, I think most kids actually have a pretty good intuition for composition. And I think the secret of good composition is that there needs to be dynamism and force, but some sort of like, kind of like elegant balance behind it all too. And so like, you, you could either do this in Photoshop or you could just do this on a piece of paper, but I, I like to do it in Photoshop because it just makes things a little bit more interesting. So essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to essentialize the composition to the purest form of the shapes and stuff like that. And it, it, it becomes very interesting because then you could hide certain parts of the composition in the frame. You're like, oh, okay, does it still work or not? And so this is like one thing that I would like to uh, bring up is that I call this like visual stress testing. Do you guys know what a stress testing is? When you go to the doctor and you have to do those uh, step tests to test your heart. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. How about from an engineering perspective? Oh, well, it's, it's basically putting load on something until it breaks. Mm, yeah, so. Same um, thing, basically. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so kind of to uh, June's point. June, did you study, um, you study engineering? Well, science, but close enough. All right, so this is also another thing I wanted to think too, is that like science plus art is certainly the best combination. Cause like, this is, this is, my, this is my theory, is that the, Cross-pollination, I, I, the more I think about this notion, I love it, cross-pollination. The, the gist is you could take what we consider disparate forms of whatever. So we tend to think that science and art are antagonists, but if you look at Da Vinci, we knew that he kind of combined both masterfully. So for those of you guys who like to, you know, nerd out on a computer, I think it's, it's so cool what we can do with photography because Photography is an art form and we could get you to use all the toys and the tools to do it. And so thinking about these engineering scientific notions are good. So like, you know, even uh, June being an engineer, um, you know, he, he's essentially like a visual engineer and could um, put together certain ideas. Um, and so I, I want to show you guys some, uh, some fun techniques we could do. So one of them is called Gaussian blur. And essentially, there was like a German scientist his name was Mr. Gauss or something. And essentially, it's just like a blurring tool that you could use from Photoshop, you could do in Procreate and other tools and stuff like that. And this is one of the secret recipes I discovered just through pure experimentation is that you're trying to stress test your images by essentially you're trying to, you're trying to break apart your composition as much as humanly possible before it doesn't become an image anymore. And so what I do is I apply a Gaussian blur to my photo, then I inverse it, then I add contrast and I inverse it again. And then you could keep doing this process over and over again. It's like, it's like um, kind of an iterative process. And to me, this is very interesting because you start to see images differently because as photographers, we're not just photographers, we're also visual artists, which mean we love artwork and we like to make artwork. And any, any tool that you use to, to see deeper is, is kind of an interesting one. So in Photoshop, uh, and don't worry, I'll, I'll send you a recording of this uh, video after, after the fact. Um, uh, so this is where it's in the, the menu. And, and you know, you could just play with the different radiuses. And so this original image applying with the Gaussian blur kind of looks like that, right? And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a general gist of the darkness or the, the brightness of the image. And so to, just to show you how I did this in uh, Photoshop. So let's say we take um, the image and go to blur, Gaussian blur. And essentially this is what I always find very interesting. You start off with the maximum blur and then you just keep working your way left until you could see what you consider an, an image. So for me, it's like, mm, maybe about here. 
And so with my, with what I could just like generally see in a very general sense, I could see some sort of shape and form, you know, here. And I could also see another shape and form about here. And the way that I could t kind of break it down and analyze it is, this is what I generally see. Um, I see all these arrows on the right, pulling your attention, your force and energy to the right side. And on the left side, you have the antagonist image in the background, pulling your eyes to the left. And I kind of like this notion of dynamic tension because, so just imagine, okay, everyone lift up your virtual hands, all right? Imagine like you're holding a spring, right? Like a very strong spring. And if you pull it in opposite directions, right? As far as you can, and then you let go of the spring, what happens? It snaps to the center. Mm -hmm. And so dynamic tension is very interesting because even if you watch a movie, right? You know, there's some sort of like sexual tension between the guy and the girl or whatever. And so typically I think what makes a good composition or whatever is there, there, there needs to be a little bit like kind of like tension in the frame. So typically when I look at my, my photographs, this is also another tip too, is look at where the eyes are going. So these eyes look like they're kind of going this way and his eyes and his nose are kind of going this way. And therefore, as a consequence, my general visual gist is, you know, something, something like that. That's, that's kind of like the, the vibes I get. And what I did before our workshop was I prepared some materials. And if you guys have Photoshop or whatever, um, I could, I could, I'll send you guys all these uh, materials after the workshop so you can just kind of play with the layers. And so essentially what I do is the way I do it is in Photoshop. So this is once again, I'll just create a new layer. And what I'll do is I'll just choose like a random color. Let's say I just choose a color red. And in Photoshop, there's this thing called the polygonal lasso tool, which I typically use. So I just click that. And I just draw a very general gist of what I see. And the key is you don't want to make it specific. You just want to make it super duper general. And I just right click, click fill, fill foreground color there. And I'll create another layer. And then let's say I'll just choose the color yellow. And then on the other side, I just try to draw the general gist. Because I think the biggest problem is, I think with good compositions, you actually don't need that much detail. If you just kind of keep things simple, they tend to, to make uh, effective compositions. And then what you could just do is, you could just make this composition, you could just make this uh, black. And you could kind of get just, okay, you kind of have this arrow on the right side going right, and you have this thing going here on the left. And um, the way that I analyzed it and broke it down was kind of like, these are the shapes I made and just kind of clicking through it. You could just essentially get a, a sense that these photos are just like being drawn to the right and left side. So I kind of have this, um, <laughs> so, so, so June, you, you, you actually might like this or, um, uh -huh. uh, um, awesome. Are you a, are you a, are you an engineer too? I am, yeah. What do, what do you do? Electrical engineer. Okay. So have you guys ever heard the MVP notion? Yes. So June, June looks excited. What, 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 is, uh, what is, what is the MVP in Silicon Valley? Minimal, minimal viable uh, product. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So if we take this notion to photography a minimum viable image how would y'all uh how would you guys uh, describe this what does that mean move all the distractions and just have minimum possible yeah the minimum possible what do you think aaron what was a minimum viable image how would you define that would that be just like a very simple image mm -hmm. without a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, what do you think, Patrick? Yeah, it's, it's that this is what I need and everything else is superfluous and doesn't need to be there. Hmm. So cutting out the superfluous, Dylan, what would you say is the minimum viable image? 
I'm not exactly sure, but uh, <laughs> going off of what like Patrick just said, probably just like the most basic composition, uh, something like that. I, I I'm really not sure. Mm. What do What do you think, uh, June? Well, minimum viable product is something that's you know uh, at the state where where a product is at, is at a state where it's presentable. Mm. You know, uh, it, it may not have all the features, it may not be perfect, but it's it's good enough so that you could call that by itself a product. So borrowing from that, mm. minimum viable image would be something that has, that ticks off all the essential boxes. Mm. It, it has a subject, it has a composition, it has an antagonist, mm. it has an eye flow, right? It, it has it a may what? Not be, an, an eye, eye flow, flow like eye flow? your you know your your eye will be following the trace. Um, that's kind of how I would define it. Uh -huh. I guess that that's kind of different from uh, what we discussed so far. Well, I know I I, lo I love it because um, actually this is where I find studying Silicon Valley like image processing and uh, computer vision very interesting because the, you know thank God for the nerds right the nerds have figured out good terms to describe how we see the world. And cause like, like we've always done, it's like, it's like, yo, like this is my eye flow. This is how I look at things. Right. But you don't know what you're doing until there's a word for it. Cause oh, I'm like, oh man, I've been doing this my whole life. Thank God someone invented a term. And so even these uh, concepts I'm introducing to y'all is that anything that could spark kind of new creative uh, insights in terms of uh, how to see the world and stuff like that, I think is, um, Quite, quite a good thing. Oh, hey, Linda, how you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. I love, I love your hair. Thank you. I need okay. your haircut. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, um, so t talking about minimal viable image. So the reason why I love this notion is that I think we tend to get too caught up in making a picture perfect photo with all the details and da -da -da. but then truth be told, okay, raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Right? Okay, this is a sad reality. 99% of people are looking at your photos through a four inch screen. So as a consequence, they're not gonna see the small details in your pictures. And so like what I would actually recommend is, this is what I like to call the small thumbnail test. So what is the small thumbnail test? So the small thumbnail test is in which So small thumbnail test is if you know, okay, how do you know if your photos are good or not? The way you know your photos are good or not is if you look at your photos as small thumbnails, if the photo still evokes emotion or mood in your photographs, it probably means it's a good photograph. And it's, it's actually funny because you could even see a photo super duper small and you still kind of get a good gist of what, what it was about. And so even nowadays when I'm looking at my photos through like, you know, Lightroom or photos or even on my, my iPad or whatever, I try to actually intentionally look at them as uh, small thumbnails. And so what you could even do is like, if you, if, you have, if you guys have a Mac, right? You know, there's these different ways that you can look at through your photos. I've actually quite been enjoying uh, this view here, this, um, this contact sheet like view, because you can kind of get a general sense of the, the composition of your images. Like, oh, you know, I could see a lady, you know, and then the, the, the human eye is amazing is that we could detect a human face from almost like half a mile away. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's something in our human DNA. So, you know, I know that's a laughing lady. You know, I look through this, I know that's a laughing lady. I know that's a human. Um, or just like even with uh, compositions, like bold, bright and visual. So like this, uh, this, this image of Cindy, so that's one thing that's really important in photography because I think, and then, and then the, the, the really optimistic thought is then you don't really need the world's best camera with the most megapixels, the whatever's, because as long as you focus on this uh, minimum viable image, I think it's actually gonna be much more motivational to uh, your photographs. So we were talking about stress testing our images. So, um, if I could give you guys uh, some uh, fun activities and assignments, what y'all could do. So, do you guys uh, do you guys have Photoshop? Yeah. All right. Uh, if you don't have Photoshop, you could just download like a 15-day trial, 
And so one of the fun activities that I actually like to do in Photoshop is, um, especially if you, if you guys are all stuck in quarantine or whatever, right, is this is one activity. In filters, there's like a quadrillion different filters that we could do to our images. So your, your assignment is you have to choose a photograph that you like and apply every single Photoshop filter to your image. <laughs> and as a consequence, it will actually help you better understand what makes your photographs interesting. So I have, I have different examples, right? So like, for example, this mosaic one, it's kind of cool because you, you guys ever play on like a Super Nintendo or a Nintendo or Pac-Man? Essentially, you're making your, your artwork into 8-bit, right? So yo, that's kind of crazy that this composition, it's, it's a good composition because I could turn it into a mosaic and I could still kind of get a general gist of what's going on in the composition. Pretty cool, right? And so I spent about an hour this morning <laughs> stress testing my own images. So it's so funny because like this is like one of these really old photos I shot almost 2009. This is like, I shot this photograph when I was like 21 and I was just like, I just graduated college and I was in Korea for the first time. So what I did was I took my image and I applied all these different filters to it. And I just kept adding filters. This one's like uh, edge detect. And, Sorry? I, I just said I really like that last one. Which one? This one? That one. Oh, what, what do you like about it, Patrick? It feels like um it feels like a panel out of a comic book. A good graphic Ooh. novel. Oh. Oh, that's also a good thing too. If you want to study good compositions, comic books actually and uh, graphic novels are actually a good source of inspiration. And so I'm visually testing it, and essentially what we're trying to do with composition. It's called edge detection, where um, you're trying to detect the edges and the contours of your photographs. Because if it's too difficult for you to detect in uh, the edges and the, the, the sides of the photographs, it tends to make the photos much more difficult. So this is like embossed, right? So you could, you could kind of get a general sense of like the, the edges of the, the composition, which means that it's good. And then just like, you know, all these different filters and stuff like that. Even, this is actually uh, another theory I have too, is, um, have you guys ever shot a film? Like um, the 35 millimeter film? I've been doing a lot of it the last two weeks again. Oh, cool. So typically most people think that film photos look better than digital photos, right? And I've always wondered, why does film photos with all the grain and grit and the stuff, why does it look more beautiful than digital? And this is my theory. So my theory is when a photograph is more gritty and obscure and there's more noise, it forces you, the viewer, to actually use your brain power to try to decipher the image and see what's going on. So as a consequence, you're actually more engaged with the photograph and you're actually uh, more interested in it. Interesting theory, right? So contrary to what we've been taught, maybe the best photos are actually the ones which are like a little bit imperfect or a little bit obscure in some sort of way. There's this, um, there's this Italian word called chiaroscuro, which essentially means like high contrast, low contrast, but it means obscure, clear. And so you need some parts of your photo which are obscure, but also some parts of your photo which are clear. So sometimes I think adding grain to your photos digitally is actually an effective tool for that. And this is actually an interesting filter too. This is where I add like max noise. Even though you add like a ton of noise, you could still kind of get a sense of what the image is. You could, you could still see the, the lady and the, you know, you could still see the outline of the lady here, the leading lines. And so through stress testing, what you're trying to do is you're trying to intentionally mess up your image and trying to get to, to a point where it's no longer an image. So these are all the, the different filters that I, I've uh, applied to my images. You guys want to see something cool? Yes. All right, so. I love your ripped outfit. Oh yeah, this, uh, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you like my, you like my, my hole here? Yeah. These are actually real, real holes because I wear these like merino wool leggings and they just kind of rip because I work out so much. <laughs> go check this out. Oh, Aaron's back in the house. Okay, you have to watch this. 
Whoa. Ah. That's awesome. That's incredible. <laughs> is, that, is that pretty awesome or what? That's that awesome. awesome. Oh, okay. Nice. Woo -wee. So uh, essentially that what that is, is um, it's, they call this a pseudo planche, plank, planche. I think gymnasts do this. But I've just been trying to do more like, my, my, my thought on fitness actually during quarantine is that like, it's like you're trying to do a cool skateboarding move, like, you know, being able to do that move. It's kind of like, there's no real functional purpose behind it, but it just looks kind of cool. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, like your, like to what your point is that, that like workout is play. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, man, we should, we should, we'll, we'll, we'll share some workout tips. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Like you want the eyes of the viewer to be led a certain direction. And you also want a certain visual power or force to emanate from the image. So even with this kind of image, what one, one of the, one of the pro tips I'll give is when you're framing somebody or you're composing somebody, think about the background lines. So in terms of the perspective lines here in the background, it all just emanates from this, this woman here. And it kind of gives you the, the feeling and the vibes that essentially at the end of the day, all this energy and force is being up, uh, directed upwards. And you guys can write this down too, is that they call this the Superman effect is that, so for example, you know, Tom Cruise, do you guys all know how, how tall Tom Cruise is in real life? Sure. Do you know how tall he is? Like five, four or something like that. Yeah. But when you see in a movie, how, how tall does he look? Five ten. Yeah, he he looks like he looks like you know a lot taller. Or you know Arnold Schwarzenegger. Do you know how tall he is in real life? Mm -mm. Anyone want to guess? Five seven. He, he's not that short, but his uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's actually about my height. I think he's only like five ten or five eleven. Um, but when you see him in bodybuilding, how how tall does he look? He always looks like he's like he's six two six three. Yeah, he looks, he looks like he's like 10 trillion feet tall, right? And so the, one of the best ways to make better compositions or more dynamic ones, just get, it's very simple, right? Use a wide angle lens, like a 20 millimeter or 35 millimeter, whatever, and just get down on your knees and shoot up. Because anytime you hold the camera at a super low angle looking up, it essentially makes a person look like Superman. They look larger than life. And in terms of what makes a good composition, I nowadays like to look at photos, which actually motivate and inspire me so even like when i look at this picture i personally like it because it just puts me in a good mood like even though i'm having a shitty day or whatever it, it improves my mood and i think that's also another good way to think about photos is that like a good photograph is like having a nice uh, shot of espresso like a nice light light roast preferably ethiopian to just kind of to kind of get you going right and Another technique that I wanted to share with you is uh, essentially you also know if a good photo is good is that if there's kind of like curves or an arabesque or like your eyes are being led around the frame. So I abstracted this with Cindy in Photoshop and you, know, you can see me doing the inverse test. And you can see <laughs> As a consequence, it kind of draws your eyes up and around the frame. And so uh, I think June, you're talking about the eye movement, right? Right. So kind of similarly, we look at this image and this is also a tip too. When you look at a photograph, we look at what the subjects are looking at. So think about the eyes. The eyes could also draw an arrow looking up so even when, when it comes to advertising, sometimes this is where it's good to look at advertising. Actually, an effective advertisement is if the advertisement is looking at you, because it gets a, a better sense of what direction the, the photo is going. So like this photo, you see Cindy's eyes looking up. As a consequence, it also leads your eyes up. And I think what tends to make a good composition in terms of eye tracking or eye movement is essentially you want to just 
move the subject's eyes around the frame. You don't want it to just be in one corner of the frame. The more you could kind of like do a body scan or the to see the whole package, it's it's kind of nice. It's like, um, you know, for example, if you're looking at a bodybuilder, you're not just looking at his biceps, you're also looking at his thighs, his, qu his quads, and you're kind of looking at the whole package. And the more you could kind of get people's eyes to scan around, um, the, the better. So y'all send me some awesome photos. You guys want to take a look? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So nice, nice picture of me, right? <laughs> All right, so well, we'll go through the we'll go through the photographs. Right, whose was this? I did, and I have not done one thing to it. I didn't know what to do with it. Okay, cool. <laughs> but I like it. Okay, <coughs> I like it too, Linda. All right, so, so but everyone... there's something not right. I'm I'm not sure what to do with it. Okay. I know it's too dark. I didn't like. I didn't do anything with it. Hmm. Okay, so um, so class. What are, what are you guys' thoughts? What do you guys like about the photo and what do you think could use an improvement? I love the line of the fence or whatever that is to the tree. Yeah, and I like the, I like the, the curving line in the water, the, the foam. Oh, yeah. Like the foam here? Yeah. And they both point to the tree, which is in the center of the frame, which is nice. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, I think it's kind of interesting that where you expect to see like the ground, it's just water. Oh, so the this is all just water here. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of I guess interesting. You know? mm. Also, I I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure at all what to crop out. Mm. You know how to crop it. I think the composition is actually quite good. I uh, like also the the thing that kind of divides it, like the fence. You would think that the photo would stop there, but when you look to the right, it's those those trees over there are very beautiful. I'm which, trying to um, figure out if those are reflections as well, which I think they are. Which, which but tree? it um, so if you so that that fence thing to the right when you look to the right of the photo, so all of those trees oh, back okay. there in the background. Oh, okay. And I like how it kind of draws you in. I was trying to figure out if those were reflections, oh. so it really pulled me in. Even well, though the lines aren't going in that direction, when I went that way, it looked um, interesting to me. So I actually, okay, so this is also another thing. You know, like I assume most of us are watching this, you know, like we like Sharif Patark or whatever. Um, so I mentioned this in the last workshop. I like this notion of like the visual stimulus barbell where you spend some time going in a very urban environment, but sometimes in a very natural environment where there's no trees, no Wi-Fi, no nothing, because it is almost like a visual palate cleanser. So in terms of my critique for this photo, I, I think just the big thing is, so what I actually really think of the cherry on top in this photo is, is that the reflection of the tree, right? But the problem is it's being cut here. Visually, my eye wants to see the whole tree here. So if you photograph this differently, take a step back and at least show up to that point. And then this also be nice too because it would actually accentuate this curve here um other things that could help this this uh photograph so i would actually say um you know uh linda don't worry too much about the processing whatever that's that's not more that, yeah. that's, that's okay. important. and then okay the, the question is this how hardcore are you like are you willing to wake up at 5 a.m and photograph this as sunrise or sunset no <laughs> <laughs> yeah me, me, me neither I, I tend to be very lazy okay so Certain things we could do, which I, I, I do personally enjoy like doing. So um, typically, this is, my, this is just a very practical tip. When the lighting is not good, when it's just uh, a little bit flat, you could always just turn it into black and white. I think it tends to improve the images. So this is just, use the, this is just using the default Photos app in the, the iPhone, iPad. And you know, this is for free on the, the computer too. And essentially, just kind of keep playing with the contrast and stuff like that. And I do find that when you're adjusting the image in black and white, it just makes it a little bit more, it, it's just nice because it allows you to just focus a little bit more on the shapes and the forms. Um, I think the color version is nice too, but at least the nice thing with black and white is. Well, I, I wasn't interested at all in the color. I was more, but I, my concern was, should I take something off the left? Uh, some well, of the, I, I think the dark trees. I think it's good. Left side, should I? No, 
it, it feels it feels good. Like, um, oh, also another homework assignment for you, Linda, or everyone in the class. If you really, really want to improve your compositions, just spend a year to not crop any of your photos. And then when oh. you're actually shooting, um, my, this is my rationale. So th there's nothing wrong with cropping, but if you want to exercise your composition muscles by forcing yourself not to crop, it actually makes you engage a little bit more with the scene when you're you're photographing it. So actually, I think the the photo the, the composition is very good. I like I like the the curve here. I like the the trees here, and I think it's good because you have this you know all these curves here, and the, the water looks nice. Yeah, I would just say next time, and then the the lines here are really awesome too. What I would say next time, Linda, is just just take a step back. Also, what you could do in this type of photo. Also, next time. Experiment just shooting as a vertical frame. So typically whenever I see any sort of uh, compositions or frames, I always try to shoot it both horizontal and vertical. And then when I, you know, I take like a hundred photos of the scene, I just go home and I choose my best one. Because if you shot this as a vertical one, then you could better accentuate the height of the tree and you could better accentuate the, the, the reflection yeah. here. And you could also better accentuate the curve here. So that, that actually, this actually might be a better composition. Yes. And my thought is, like, obviously you can't rewind time and, you know, go back and reshoot it, but the importance of studying our compositions is, I'm sure you're going to see lots of similar scenes like this in the future. So taking what you learn from your past photos and applying to your future photos. Nice one. All right. Whose photo? Uh, mine. All right. So what are, what are you guys' thoughts? It feels powerful and almost a little bit ominous. Mm. It's that Superman effect from earlier. Mm. I like how the arrows are going into the frame and people are coming, you know, out of it. Yeah. And then people are going out of it. So the question is, how could we improve this composition or if, if, if Dylan shot this again, how, what, what could have been a better position? I want to see the, the man's feet. Yeah, I was just about to say, I really regret not stepping back just a little bit more, mm. but they're coming at me pretty fast. Yeah. Well, this is actually why in scenes like this, it's actually really good to just shoot with like a 20 millimeter. I mean, I know, I know you got your, you got your Rico now too, but um, yeah, like, that's a thought, but let, let's, let's assume that you had the shot again too. How else could you have framed this differently? Maybe vertical. Hmm. Maybe like, even, even like something like this as a composition could be interesting as well because you have something in this corner which kind of balances the frame and you also could really emphasize this movement uh which is quite cool and then you also get the the buildings in the backgrounds which is kind of nice and also another term which is kind of nice is that like like the repetitions of these forms here they're essentially like piano keys so it's like boom 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 so it, it kind of plays a nice melody um because like if i looked at this picture uh, this is another tip too. What's more interesting, this side or that side? That's not the side with the soldiers. With the soldiers, right? And so I, <laughs> I kind of like this notion. All killer, no filler. <laughs> do you guys know that thing? No. Oh, do, do, do you guys? Do you guys? Do you guys know that that Wendy's ad from back in the day? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? Okay, so we look at the scene, right? Where's the beef? Soldiers. Soldiers. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say some, some not nice things, okay? So this is like your pickles, your lettuce, your <laughs> ketchup, whatever. This is like the beef, right? And so focusing on the beef, I think is a, a more productive idea. Right? Wait, can I just say one thing about that previous one? It was just like, I like the two, um, or, or rather, there's like a contrast because the guy in the yellow vest is a protester, mm. and the police uh, are on the other side, and I, I like that sort of okay. 
no, no, I think, I think, I think, I think that's good. Um, okay, so um, this is a hard thing with street photography. You cannot play God and rearrange things, but in the ideal world, you see how all these guys are marched like this. In the ideal world, you would also similarly have protesters mirroring it almost exactly. Then it would make a truly great composition where it kind of plays to that concept that you you have going on. Um, I agree. And so, I mean, and this is this is a hard thing, Dylan, and everybody. The question is, how bad do you want it? Like. You could be out shooting this scene for 10 hours and only get one photo. You might not get the photo. And so it just comes down to your portfolio is that like, what is your standard? And if it's anything less of what you consider quote, quote, perfect, you know, is it worth sharing? I suppose is, is the question. Um, and so um, I actually think this composition is, is stronger. Um, it's quite interesting. So what are some of the composition elements you guys see in this photo? Okay, what was the question? Oh, sorry. What are the compositional elements you guys see in this photo? Or the colors or whatever? I like the profile. Hmm. The profile? Yes. Hmm. So this is a question. Where in the frame is a little bit empty? Middle, or, or I guess. Yeah. Here, right? Yeah. So, question. If, uh, this, this is, okay, so this is also why I'm always thinking, right? So what is the meat of the photo? So if we're looking at this picture, what, where, where is the beef? I think it's right in the center with a flag and the, the policeman closest to me is. I could have shot it vertically, maybe. Mm, yeah, OK, so some thoughts. Um, I would have just framed this, got super, super close, and just framed it kind of something more like this. So what you could do when you're shooting street photography is you get so, so close to the subject in the foreground, but you put your focus in the background, which is this flag. And as a consequence, so this is actually, so let's, let's, let's play a little fun little game here, okay? So this would be my ideal composition. So you remember the, the screenshot I shared with you? So, and then this is one app I like to use, it's called Procreate. So this is, this is where we'll play and have fun, okay? So in a perfect world, so, this this guy on the on the right side i'd want the subject to be so close that the face and the profile of the of the guy in the army head look kind of like this and then the flag in the background would be more distant looking like like this where essentially you know, you know, you know that the composition's good is, so this is the frame, right? Do you notice that this is what they call the bookend where the, all the green is filling up the right side of the frame and then you can see the soldier's profile here, right? And then you got the, the flag back here. Um, the, the problem with the, the composition right now is that there's too much empty space here on the right side which actually doesn't really um, help the composition, because you ideally you, you you actually you don't you don't want this this space here. This is this is uh, not good. So you know obviously if you're using some sort of photo software or whatever, you know people tend to just like you know crop and say okay bada bing bada boom we good right. But it's much more interesting if you do this in camera where when you're shooting. You just try to get super, super close to your subject, where you're standing more about here. You're shooting this way, and you're just trying to capture 
just that. Um, so essentially, the moral of the story is get super duper close. <laughs> well, that's kind of crazy, huh? Okay, Who's, whose vote is this? This is mine. All right. So, um, so class, what are some of the the compositional elements we see here? Lady waving in the in the bottom left corner. Yep. Oh, I just realized she has rollerblades on. Yep. Yo, okay, is it just me or is rollerblading the game popular again? Not just you. <laughs> in the city, you see a lot more bicycle riders and rollerbladers since quarantine has happened. Yeah. Oh, weird. And she was just riding by at the top of her lungs. I don't know how well you know Chicago, but I was at Adams and LaSalle yeah. walking back to the train station. And I just heard the singing off to my left while I was trying to take a picture of the financial plaza yeah. and I had just gotten to Panasonic starting to get used to it first time shooting mirrorless yeah. and I turned around and got her as quickly as I could and it was what it was but her smile and her exuberance and her energy was just contagious oh yeah that, that's great all right so in terms of looking at this composition what is everyone's favorite compositional elements well, I like her and I also like, you know, the stuff that's going on with the signs. The signage is kind of cool with an arrow one way, more, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, like the, those are all kind of interesting kind of uh, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like symbols. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, like that. They're, you know, in, in an ideal world, I, you know, they would be take up more of the frame um, but I, but I like, I like those and I like her. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also like one question. What would it look like if you flipped it? Oh, what do, what do you mean? If you split the image. Upside what? down? You mean horizontal, like, like a... It means I think reflect it, reflect it on the side, right? Like that? No. no, can you flip her to the other side, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You mean put her put her on the right side of the frame? Oh, okay. cool. so so like uh, assuming she was here. Yeah. Well, no, no. I meant the whole image. I don't know. Like flip, like in Lightroom, you can like flip horizontal. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's. Wait. Oh, you mean? Uh, like, uh, yeah, reflect. You like, do you mean like crop cropping like this? No. Horizontal. Like he said, like in light roll. Oh, yeah, there's a button you can press where it's like you can. We could we could do this. We could do this, guys. All right, here, like that. Yes. Nice. All right. So, what do you guys think? No, I, it would look better the other way. But I, that's what I was first thinking. We put her on the right hand side, and because visually it seems like you want to go that direction, but no, that looks better. That's <clears> because her hand. Her hand is. Because of the position of her hand, she, your eye is leading into the scene, which I think is good. Hmm. Okay, well, no, we'll, the other one didn't look right to me. You guys want to hear something interesting? So, you know, uh, when you're reading uh, text in a book, what direction do you read? Left to right. Left to right. Do you know how Arabic is read? Right to left. So, this is actually very interesting because this then means how people read your photos is actually very uh, subjective to their culture. Hmm. So have you guys ever picked up uh, a Japanese manga or comic book? Yes. What direction does it go? It starts in what my world is the back page. Right? So, it's interesting. Um, I, I look at this picture. What my favorite things are these piano keys here. Yes. And it's nice to see a happy person. Like I feel like with all this COVID things happening, and also very interesting. Holy moly! When's the last time you've seen Chicago so empty? Yeah, I was gonna say the fact that it's so such a clean background and there's no one else in the frame. It's mm -hmm. hard hard to do in street photography, but I guess right now when everyone's inside, it's a little easier, but oh, I is, really like that. Yeah, so, okay, so this is also just like a thought too. So I kind of like this picture because 
this is definitely a COVID-19 photo, which I find very interesting. Um, if you wanted just a purely graphical image, something like this would be very good too, because then it, it allows you to, you know, focus more. And then you see, you see certain things, like you see the curve of her headphone, you see her, her hand wave, and also you get to focus more on this here. So I would suggest, Pat, the next time when you're, when you're down there again, try to also shoot photos which are just like uber minimalist, like extreme minimalism and just like the forms. Because like you, what you can even do too is like, even if you just photograph just the skates and lines, I think this oh, like, that would have been fun. Yeah. All right. So you, you, you live there. So you, you go back, right? Whose photo? All right, maybe this is Jonathan's book, all right? So what are, what are the, the, the compositions you guys see here? I think it's awesome. <clears throat> what, do, what do you find awesome about Linda? The, the lighting is on the child, the person's arm, and then the, I mean, the lighting just draws you right exactly to where you want to be. Hmm. <clears throat> the subtle lighting. There, there's that shadow in the light. Ooh, yeah. shadow in the light. Uh -huh. What colors do you see? Brown is the first thing I see because the first thing I see is the dog. And Brown. then after that, there's pinks and reds. Hmm. The blue, blue and the blue jeans. Hmm. So actually, what makes this composition so effective? So typically, I think color photography is actually more difficult than black and white photography because you need the colors to look good if you actually want um, a good composition. So. We could do the same thing. So you remember the, the, the thing I talked about Gaussian blur? So here it is in um, this Procreate app. So I could apply a Gaussian blur to this image. Can you guys see the colors still? Yes. So what I like to do is to color sample, you just push and hold a part of the frame. So essentially the color of this dog is roughly that. The color of this girl's thing is like roughly that. The color of his arm is Roughly that. The color of his blue jeans is roughly that. And the color of this girl's head is like kind of like roughly that. So if you just did extreme abstraction, nice, right? Yeah. Ooh. That's great. Genius. <laughs> um so once we abstract it, this is where things get interesting. You could actually get a better sense of the, the composition. So now we look at like this. Are there any other compositional elements you guys see that you guys find interesting? Looks like a Picasso. Hmm. Like a Picasso. Does anyone see the subtle triangle? Yeah, in the lakes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And there's a there's a lot there's like a diagonal going from the top left to the bottom right of the dog's face. That's yep. really nice. Mm -hmm. And you can complete the the rest of the triangle with the left side of the frame too with that line. Hmm. Well, one one thing I like to see too is I see this is a triangle. Is so like if I made this even more abstract, right? Let's say this is this. That is that, and uh, this is this is this, right? So to me, this is like almost the extreme distillation of the image. And when I look at it like this, then I could kind of see this triangle composition. Whoa, good composition, huh? So I find that a good composition is the more you analyze it, the more interesting it becomes. Um, so. Because what we're trying to do with the photos is that we're, we're essentially looking for what I call a visual gist. Gist, it doesn't have to be super perfect, but yeah, you just kind of get the, the shapes and the forms here. You got a face here and face here. So if you can make your photos extremely simple, they're good, all right? Um, all right, so with this photo, so if we drew this again into a, uh, to procreate. This is also another notion which is important to think about. It's called figure 
to ground. So essentially means whether your subject, your figure, is matching the background. So the, the good thing is when you look at this picture, who's, whose face is the brightest? Protester. Uh, the woman? The yeah. girl? You can, you can see that, right? Yeah. But still the difficult thing about this picture is if we add a Gaussian blur to it, right? Jeez. You could still kind of see this, this woman's face kind of like the primary center of this image-ish. But what are some of the other distractions in this photo? The sky. So how, how bright is the sky? It's the brightest value in this image. Hmm. So what's, what's the problem about that? Well, it detracts from her face. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is also thinking about composition as like a visual language is that like in the ideal world, the, the point of the photo is you're trying to show the woman's protester's face against all these cops, right? But because of all this stuff here on the top of the frame, it kind of detracts from that. So a more ideal photo would be, you know, um, not to say you should crop it, but let's say you framed it differently, right? If you just gotten super duper close and framed it maybe like something like this, it'd be much more effective because I think the problem is the photo is trying to say too much. Um, there's, there's almost too much detail for me. I would prefer a much more simple direct image here, right? Whose photo? That was a nice one. That's mine. Ooh. I, took, I took it yesterday and I didn't do anything to it. I, I love the scene. It looks like somewhere in Scotland or something, but I have no clue what to do with it. Cool. And I first went over there to take the picture without the, the railing with the rocks on it. And I'm going, that would be good foreground, but it was so juxtaposed. I was not sure exactly how to, how to shoot it. Hmm. So what do you, what do you guys think? I didn't know the rocks were on the railing. So people have been putting the rocks. I guess everyone goes up the trail, puts a rock on there. And to me, that added to the story. Hmm. But I, I'm not at all pleased with the composition. I really like the light in this photo. So it's there's something very, it, it's sort of, a, everything has a lot of really nice texture to it because of the, um, is it overcast or something about it? That, it was overcast. Oh, yeah, there's, there's just, there's just a lot, I don't know, it just feels, I don't know, I like the, I like the textures of everything in this photo. And I love how the road and the rocks are taking you this way, and then the road and the trees take you this way. Hmm. Well, maybe it's better than I thought it was. I, I, I just, whatever, I took a lot of different shots, maybe 20. I, I included more fence, less fence. Um, Ooh, okay. So what we could do, so. I couldn't get a feel for what I wanted. So this is what we could do. So what I'll do is, I'm just going to draw in the geometric shape that I personally see. There's a triangle. I didn't even see that. that. Need to, to kind of better dissect the composition, whether you feel like it went in a direction which you personally liked. And I, 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 hadn't, I did not intend to put the rocks in it, but to me, the rocks gave you the story. Like everyone trudged that hill, put a rock on the railing. All right, so now that we're looking at the composition more abstracted, what do y'all think? Your eye moves around a lot, which is nice. What you're saying, like that's what you want, you want in, a, in a good image. Right? Mm. So it feels like your eyes move around a lot, right? I think your eyes are going to end at the end of the trail. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, exactly. I'm going from right to left and then up. Right to left and then up here? Mm -hmm. hmm. That, that was what I was hoping for, was that that would be the focal point right there. Well, yeah, definitely here's the, 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 the focal point is. I mean, it's, uh, I, I could have, I could have changed, uh, you know, it's really hard to even find a horizon line because everything was kind of wacky as far as balance. Mm. <coughs> so, these are some thoughts. So 
I'm, I'm going to go back to that place every time. Yeah, yeah I'm going to go back every time good. today and work on that. All right. This will just be me nitpicking. I think this is like not necessary. I, I didn't know whether to put a leg on the fence. So maybe was the fence would look like it was suspended in the air or yeah. shit. And I could have included another leg, but I just didn't know what to do with it. So um, this is my thought. If you got really, really close and you didn't show the leg, to me it'd be more interesting because the photograph actually looks more surreal. Because I think the point of composition and photography and art, it's not necessarily to show what real life really looks like. It's more of like your artful interpretation of uh, reality. And so when it comes to thinking about your compositions, to me, a photo like this would be much more interesting because it's surreal. It looks like the, the rocks are levitating in the air. So, so generally, Linda, my, my suggestion is when you're composing a scene, try to make it look more unreal. Unreal, okay. Um, or like even in another thought too, right? If you compose this even differently, you got really close to the rocks, you just put the rocks here in the foreground and you know, let's say you framed it like something like this. Then to me, that becomes very interesting because it, it just kind of simplifies the, the scene, like just yeah. having this in the foreground here. And it actually does help you focus on this little trail here. Um, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, you'd have like a tractor or something, um, which would kind of complete the composition. But yeah, I think actually the original composition is, 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 is actually quite strong. Uh, something I also want the class to think about too, which is kind of fun about photography. To me, the reason why this photo is so nice is that it makes me think of life beyond the frame, right? Because we know in real life, the landscape looks probably something more like like that right there's like there's there's other stuff happening in the world and so i think that's a sign of a good composition where the photo invites you to explore real life more because certainly no one wants to be stuck in their apartment all day right so i think photos which actually encourage you to leave your house <laughs> good photo <laughs> all right let's see and uh whose photo is this oh uh, that's mine all right so let us analyze this composition. So Aaron, where did you photograph it? Um, that's in a bedroom that I'm staying in. Ooh. In Florida. Oh, cool. So, so I try to do something not, I try to do something I did recently, not Ooh, something like from it. the streets. So uh, good question. What, what, what mood or vibes does everyone get here? I almost feel like I'm in an abandoned barn with bright light coming through, and it's just mystery. Mystery. Hmm. I have the urge to turn it to the left. Like? I put the lights at the top. Like that? Yes. Oh. oh. Ooh. How does this change the, the mood? Well, you really don't know what it is anyway. I mean, I would not know what it is. So to me... It makes it seem more heavenly or it reminds me that, you know, the famous Paul Strand um, photograph of it's like the, the light coming down. I, I want to say it's like in like the... Grand Central. Central or was oh, that it? Yeah. yeah. Then it feels like the light's coming from here. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like that better almost. How about, how about, how about this? I like it better on the right or top, better. I like that too. How about this? That might look well. Oh. <laughs> okay, so this, okay, so this, I think we're actually onto something very interesting, guys. So here's the photo, right? And here's the lights, right? There's a difference between having the lights on the bottom of the frame and having the lights on top of the frame. Hmm. Right. So, um, so let, let's say I took Aaron's picture and let's say I just made like an abstract image. Right. So let's say I just made a drawing. Let's say it's like something like that. So let's say the, the light source is on the top of the frame. 
Or if you flipped it, it's on the bottom of the frame. Or let's say it's on the right side of the frame. Or let's say it's on this side of the frame. How does this change your perception of the image? Interesting, right? <laughs> yeah, when, when, it, when you shifted it to the top, it literally made it to me and I took it. So I, it's different because of the mood I was in when I took it, but it makes it so much literally lighter. Mm. It, so, like, so uh, like not as heavy. Mm. And you've got vertical lines coming off of it, like the sun rays or whatever, light rays. So you can get more like the, the rays going this way, right? Yes. Because that is different from this, right? Right. And it's different from this. Right. And it's different from this. Right. So, Aaron, my suggestion, I, I, I love this project and concept. I think you should keep doing it, especially since you're, we're all stuck in quarantine and in the suburbs or whatever, where create like a visual experiment where, you know, shoot 100 photos of the different light source, position it differently in the frame, and kind of like ask yourself like, depending on where I put the light source, how does it change the mood of my image? So for example, essentially you're, if I, if I wanted to sketch this more accurately, so let's say this is your frame. So essentially your composition is kind of like, kind of like something like that is, is generally my gist of what your, your photo is. So if you're on the top of the frame, that's different than this, and then this, and then this. And I think all the photos are saying different things too. So like, essentially I just see a triangle shape here actually. Yeah. So if I abstracted this more, got triangle this way, got triangle that way, got triangle that way, got triangle that way. And this is my, this is my grand theory. I think it comes down to physics. I think. That one feels more comfortable. Yeah, it feels more comfortable. Right. So, um, for example, the difference between a vertical frame is it accentuates more of this up and down feeling, right? And it feels more erect, it feels taller. Whereas if you have the box, like imagine if you literally had, you know, a box like that. So let me, let me give you a better example. Um, so, everyone, everyone can see me? Yes. All right, cool. Oh, yo, is this Inception? <laughs> oh my God, I think I'm having a seizure. Okay, so, all right, so, question. So, you see this uh, tissue box? All right? You see our tissue box? Yes. So the question is, what is more stable? If it's like this, or if it's like this? Vertical. It's more stable when it's vertical? Are you sure? Well, uh, sta you, did you say stable or? Stable. No, not as not as stable. Right? Because then I could, it's, it's easier to topple. Right? But if it's on the ground like this, how hard is it to topple over? It's more grounded. Yeah. So, um, are cars shaped like this or like that? Horizontal. <laughs> right. Have you guys ever seen those things in the news where people have the the cars with their SUVs, and then it goes through a turn and it topples over? Yes. So to take this back to composition, right? So imagine this is your tissue box, right? If the box is just like this, it's more like steady where it's like more grounded to the ground. But if the box is vertical, it's actually more unstable, it can be shifted. Like kind of similar thing is that like, you think about a human being, You see me? Fragile. Okay. So what's, what's more stable? Me standing erect and trying to balance on one foot or me 
lying on the ground on the floor, what's, what's more stable? You lying down. Yeah. So the difference between if you frame it vertically versus horizontally, the difference is horizontal photos feel more stable and vertical photos feel more like kind of skyscraper. They're a little bit more off kilter. And so 